Namam Vishnu Badaya Krishna Bristaya Buddha Deshi Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prachalani Nirvase Shashunya Vali Pashtati Vashashalani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Sri Gorda Karinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Uh, so this is just a very simple presentation on Bhagavad Gita, just to give people an introduction. Actually, meant for people who don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. And so I call it lessons in transformation: how to uh, transform the personality. Mm. Everybody wants to change for the better. Okay, so, uh, of course, uh, here we're using Bhagavad Gita as an authority, uh, some sort of uh, book of, uh, authorized book. Mm. So this is one uh, principle that we have to accept when we're going to discuss spiritual life. Uh, in the modern world, uh, among some people, uh, being spiritual is uh, some popular uh, goal. Uh, but the tendency is to find out for yourself what is spiritual life and not uh, consult anybody or anything. Но тяхната тенденция е да разберат какво означава духовния живот сами, без да се консултират с никого. The sociologists even give a term to this type of person. Социологите даже са измислили термин за този тип личност. They are called postmodern generation, after modern. Това е постмодерното поколение след модернизма. So the the typical uh, quality of this person is that if they're going to be spiritual, they'll reject all authority. They'll just do under their own, that's all. They won't take any scriptural authority at all. 
и характеристиката на тези личности, че те, ако ще бъдат духовни, това означава, че те ще отхвърлят всякакъв авторитет. Сентимента са тъй хубава, обаче крайните резултати ще бъде много лош. So definitely people don't want to be uh, uh, limited by uh, restrictive rules and regulations and dogma. Mm. But at the same time, uh, we do need some guidance. Mm. Uh, so in uh, Vedic uh, life, Uh, they always accept an authority. Mm. Uh, so this is the scriptural authority. We accept uh, the Vedas and the Puranas and the Itihasas, the scriptures of India as authority. Mm. This means that we don't concoct our own type of spiritual life or our own concept of a God or anything. We go to the scriptures and we find out what they say. Uh, now, of course, there is a little bit of a contradiction in accepting scripture as an authority. Uh, because Atma spirit soul and god are ultimately beyond words защото атма дух бог това са beyond words това са думи които са отвъд неразбираеми and even even the vedas accept that the 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 supreme lord is beyond words and mind а и дори ведите приемат това защото върховният Бог е отвъд думите. So therefore, we cannot expect that words can convey God or soul even. Затова ние не можем да очакваме, че думите ще могат да обяснят Бога или дори душата. Ultimately is a realization or an experience, not a bunch of words. В крайна сметка, това е въпрос на усещане, на реализация, а не на просто на някакви думи. Nevertheless, uh, this, uh, though, Scripture says yes, Uh, realization is beyond words and mind, etc. Still, we have the scriptures there. They have a purpose. И въпреки че самите писания казват да, Богът е реализация, която е отвъд думите, въпреки това ние имаме писанията и те имат някаква цел. And actually in the 10th uh, canto of Bhagavatam, the 87th chapter, there's a whole discussion of this how is it possible to convey the highest spiritual tattva in words? И в 10-та песен на Бага Ватам, 87 глава, има цяла дискусия за това как е възможно да се предаде духовното послание чрез материални на пръв поглед думи. And of course, even some, some, even some authorities in India will say, yes, words cannot describe Brahman or God at all. И разбира се, има някои авторитети, които казват, да, думите не могат да опишат Брахман или Бога. And ultimately, scripture itself is part of my, part of illusion. И в крайна сметка самото писание е част от мая, част от иллюзията. And of course other religions of the world also say we cannot describe God, we cannot say anything about this. И разбира се други религии в света казват да, точно така, ние не можем да опознаем Бога, не можем да кажем нищо за него. In fact the word Jehovah comes from a, a, a bunch of letters that you cannot even pronounce because they didn't want you to say the name of God because it's un unpronounceable. <laughs> всъщност името Яхова идва от една групичка от Букви, които са дори не, произнес, не може да бъдат произнесени, защото те а, са, не искат да името на Бога да бъде произнасено, защото то не може да бъде произнесено. Mm -hmm. However, the answer is given in the 87th chapter of the 10th canto, and the answer is that yes, the scriptures can describe God. Обаче, отговорът, който се дава в 87 глава на 10-та песен на Бога, там е позитивен. Да, а, думите могат да Uh, and they add, well, how is it possible? Because the Lord can empower the words to convey the message. Uh, the Lord has power. He has shakti. He has inconceivable power by which 
things which look material to us actually become spiritual. Богът има невъобразима шакти, чрез която нещата, които ни изглеждат материални, всъщност стават духовни. So therefore, scripture can give us guidance. Това писанията могат да ни дадат насока. Of course, uh, when we read scripture, we may not get immediate realization. Разбира се, когато четем писанията, ние може да не получим незабавно реализация. But it can guide us towards that realization. Но може да те могат да ни насочат към тази реализация. So therefore, the scriptural authority is accepted. Of course, even in the material world, our knowledge is subject to fault. Yeah, we have the four defects, we make mistakes. Hmm. And uh, much so, uh, much more so for something spiritual, which we can't even perceive with our material eye. Yeah. So, uh, in regards to spiritual life, therefore, uh, we should take shelter of uh, the scriptural authority. But the problem comes out, which spiritual authority, which scripture? Тогава възниква проблема кой точно духовен авторитет и кой точно писание. So, uh, an answer to that is, well, at least we can take the advice of uh, authorities, uh, persons in ancient times, what they accept. Тогава uh, ние може да приемем, че трябва да приемем uh, съвета на мъдреците от uh, древните времена, какво те са приели за авторитет. Knowledge does not suddenly appear like that. It comes in a tradition. Знанието не се появява просто така, то се предава в традиция. So even science just doesn't manifest like that. It comes in a tradition. Дори науката не се проявява просто е така. Тя идва в традиция. And one discovery and one new theory and one new formula is built upon previous theories and previous sciences, etc. Една едно научно откритие, една теория или една нова формула е базирана върху предишно откритие, предишна формула. So Einstein didn't just suddenly appear out of nowhere. No, there was a whole tradition of science and Newton and so many other scientists, and then Einstein came along. Например, Einstein не се появил просто така от нищото. Има цяла традиция, отучени преди него. Newton и така нататък. So we accept previous authorities. Така че ние приемаме предишните авторитети. So we can do that in reference to scripture also. Така че ние също можем да направим същото нещо по отношение на писанията. So we, we, uh, we take the advice of all the wise uh, sages in the past and see, okay, what do they say scripture is? Така че ние приемаме съвета на великите мъдреци от миналото и нека да видим, нека да чуем какво те приемат за авторитет на писанието. So, in India we have uh, some commonly accepted scriptures. Uh, first is the Vedas or the Shruti. В Индия ние имаме такива широко приемани писания, които са ведите, шрути. So these are, in one sense, um, outstanding in the whole world. We have scriptures around the world, but these are outstanding. Имаме писания по цял свят, но тези специално са много се отличават от другите. Historically speaking, they're older than any other scriptures in the world that we know, like the Bible, the Quran, and Buddha scriptures and whatever. Исторически, погледнато, те са по-стари от всички останали писания по света, като, например, Библията, Корана или Бодийските текстове. And there are some of the oldest scripture, uh, written, even not the scripture, but written language, uh, you know, language, uh, composed language in the world. Те са едни от най-древните, не само uh, за става по повече писания, а изобщо за uh, писмен текст в света. Hmm. And furthermore, not only the oldest, but passed down to the present day. И не само са най-древните, но те са запазили и са предавани до днес днешно. We have things like Egyptian. They have made scriptures also, but not passed down. <laughs> This disappeared eventually. Ние имаме, може да сме имали такива египетски писания, обаче те не са стигнали до, 
the Severan the Severan stamp, this is the uh, Hebrew Dalit. We have maybe Greek and Roman scriptures, but nobody knows about those things anymore. All we have is our epics, Iliad and Odyssey, but we don't have any religion and scripture about who's God or etc. Niome uh Grski Vivinski Stanley Knigi, Ubachi tens uh the Pazili Yamer will say uh Eposite Iliada or Odyssey, no Samata Religia ne ne is a pazan text. Of course, of course uh, the, the Vedas themselves, according to the, the people who accept the Vedas, is the Vedas actually don't have any age because they're eternal. Yeah, but they were only consolidated by Veda Vyas 5,000 years ago. And he divided them up into four parts, the Rig, Yajur, Sama, and Atarva. So these are, we say, the foundation of the scriptures of India. Uh, but uh, a little bit difficult to understand. Mm. And qualification to learn them also is very difficult. Yeah. So we have other works which are a little easier to understand. We have the what are called the itihas or epics. Uh, we have the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. <coughs> In Mahabharata we have the Bhagavad Gita, which has become very famous. Uh, and of these, the Bhagavad Gita, of course, is quite famous in its own right, even though it's part of a bigger work, the Mahabharata. It has also become famous. And many Acharyas have written commentaries and explanations of this work. Yeah. And, of course, uh, there's a, a summary of the what the essence of this work is. Ekam uh, Shastram uh, says, one scripture, let the scripture be Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and let there be one Lord, Devaki Putra, Krishna. Let there be one activity, service to Krishna. Let there be one mantra, Krishna's name. <laughs> Apparently this is written by Shankaracharya. <laughs> it's a good, good verse. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so it has been revered in India for a long time. So it's also a summary of the Vedic teachings. Uh, so we can get some valuable spiritual guidance from this work. Okay. Uh, the work starts out in chapter one with a, the setting. Uh, how does the Bhagavad Gita arise? So there's the whole description of a big battlefield. So it wasn't peaceful. It was a, a, a huge scene of conflict. Uh, uh, of course, a conflict of forces, evil and good. Right? Uh, but it was also internal conflict for Arjuna. Uh, uh, on what to do. Uh, so often, of course, the, the, the conflict in society or the circumstances around us which are full of conflict, uh, they they're, they're uncomfortable, and we have them all the time in the material world. We have small conflicts, and we have big conflicts. And they're all unpleasant, as the battlefield of Kurukshetra was unpleasant as well. And they, the conflicts actually represent a conflicts on many levels. Mm. 
we have personal conflicts between individuals. We get family conflicts, one family against another, one clan against another. One tribe against another tribe. <laughs> then we get bigger country against country. And then we also get religion against religion. Right? So these are some of the uh, uh, reasons for conflict. Of course, there's more as well. Yeah. But uh, through this, uh, we begin to exam uh, uh, try to uh, we start questioning what is the truth behind this? Who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, what should I do? Should I fight or not fight? Yeah. And what is the goal of all of this? Uh, so this often happens when conflicts arise. We have to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And hopefully out of the conflict we start thinking, 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 we get some sort of solution. Yeah. But unfortunately a lot of people go through the conflicts and they start thinking, thinking, but they they can't solve the problem. <laughs> and the conflicts go on and on and on because of this. Yeah. So, of course, the best thing is we do come to some solution. Mm -hmm. So in the Bhagavad Gita we get the big conflict and Arjuna begins asking questions and he wants to come to a solution also. So the reason we can't get a solution is because it takes a lot of effort. It's not so much physical effort. We have to change the way we think completely. Then we can come to a good solution. Yeah. Uh, this is what we call a paradigm shift. We have to take our circumstances we're in, we have to get out of that condition and look from a different point of view completely. Yeah. But it's very difficult for most people to do this. Yeah. Uh, because we are by our nature a little bit lazy and we're animals of habit. <laughs> we get stuck in a certain way of doing things and a certain way of thinking and we, it's very difficult for us to get out of that. It takes a lot of mental effort. So this is one of the things that Krishna emphasizes in the beginning part of the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 2. Your mind. You can do something with your mind. So of course Prabhupada says the difference between animal and human being is we're more intelligent. And which means we should do something with our mind more than the animals are doing. And we actually can do something, but generally we don't use the mind properly. Okay. So we have to understand the mind is very powerful. Huh? It is the mind which drives us into activity. It is the mind which produces karma. Uh, it is the mind which determines our future. But generally we don't control the mind at all. So where's what's our future? <laughs> uh, we can use the mind and concentrate and we can uh, achieve a goal, but if we don't use our mind, then nothing happens.
ние може да си използваме ума да се концентрираме и да постигнем света. Но ако не, не го използваме, тогава нищо няма да се случи. Кришна обяснява това малко по-късно, когато казва, че това, за което мислиш в момента на смъртта, това е твоя следващ живот. Your thought determines your next body. Твоята мисъл предопределя твоето следващо тяло. We have the example of Bharat. He thought of a deer when he was dying and he became a deer. Имаме примера на Барата, който си помислил за еленче, когато умирал и станал елен. So that thought, image of a deer in his mind, produced a body of a deer. Тази мисъл на образ, този образ на... So the mind produced a material object. And this is over from one life to the next. So the same operates within this lifetime. The mind can do many things if we concentrate the mind. For that reason, we have Mongol artists. So when you wake up in the morning, you look at the deities and you fix that image in your mind, and it should stay with you all day long. So generally, as I said, people don't control their mind. И обикновено, както вече споменахме, хората не контролират ума си. Ние имаме, да кажем, 200 мисли през деня и наши умни се разхожда на всякъде наоколо и даже ние не сме даже осъзнати къде точно се намира ума ни в момента. И заради липса на контрол тогава, къде отиваме ние, ами никъде на нито на определено място, защото умът ни просто се разхожда навсякъде. И един от първите принципи, които Кришна набляга, е, че ти трябва да контролираш ума си. Човек може да се освободи с силата на ума или да деградира заради ума си. If we use the mind properly, the mind is a friend and we can elevate ourselves higher and higher and higher. Ако използваме умът си правилно, умът ни е приятел и ние може да си дигнем по-нависоко и на по-нависоко и на по-нависоко. And if we don't know how to control the mind, it becomes the enemy and we go down and down and down. Ако не контролираме умът си, той става наш враг, тогава ни отива надолу, надолу, надолу. So the mind wants to go to objects in this world and become attracted to things. Умът обича да иска да отиде до обектите от този свят. Той става увлечен към тях. So we have to control where that mind goes. И ние трябва да го контролираме на къде отива този ум. So if we can focus the mind properly on certain things, then we can achieve those particular goals. Ако фокусираме ума върху определени неща, тогава ние може да постигнем тези цели. So, This is the first stage. We have to control the mind. Before we act, we have to control the mind. So once the thoughts are very particular, then we do the actions. And the actions produce the results. Of course, It's not just the actions, you know, thoughts and actions, etc., and results, etc. There is another force involved. Разбираш, не са само мислите, действията и резултатите. Има и други сили, които са замесени. We have behind this responsibility. А освен това, ние имаме отговорност. So, we do acts, but we have to think very carefully the consequences. Ние вършим разни неща, но ние трябва много внимателно да обмислим какви ще бъдат последиците от тези действия. Има последствия за мен, има последствия за другите живи същества. 
consequences for myself. I want something for myself. That, 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 if it, I get it, that's that's a good result. But we're not alone in this world. There's other human beings, there's other living entities, and there's the whole world itself, which isn't even conscious, but it's, it's there. And we have responsibility for our acts in relation to all of these things. So we have to think very carefully about all of our activities. Uh, what, what result is going to produce on other living entities and on the world. Yeah. So we can't just be active, we have to be very contemplative. Yeah. And this also means that we can't just be thinking of ourselves, we have to look at the whole world. We're not alone in the world, There's, everything else is there also. <laughs> so we have to be responsible. We can't we can't tell that somebody else to be responsible. We have to be responsible for our own actions. So to help us, the Lord has a little law, law of karma. <laughs> Forces us. <laughs> Our actions produce results, and uh, if we're not looking at the repercussions and other living entities, we get very bad results. We suffer. If our actions produce suffering for others, then we will get the same suffering on ourselves. <laughs> but of course, the opposite is also there. We do nice acts for other people, then we also get good results for ourselves. Uh, so it's a very just law. And it applies to the human being, not the animals. Animals don't have the intelligence to look around and judge the world and see where results are coming for other living entities. And generally, of course, the animals also are not so concerned about uh, exaggerated enjoyment, exaggerated possession of things. Yeah, but we see the human being, he's very intelligent, but at the same time, generally, uh, his senses and mind go out of control, and then he tries to enjoy more than he should, and to accrue more objects than he should. And so we have to be very careful how we act in this world. And the law of karma is there to teach us the lesson. So whether you like it or not, you have to get the results of your karma. You can't escape the law of karma. You can escape the law of the government sometimes, but you cannot escape the law of karma. So the whole law of karma is there to make us responsible. We have to understand we're not the only person in the material world. So this of course involves controlling the mind. We have to we can't just let our senses go wild or anger go wild. We have to control ourselves. Yeah. 
So once we begin to control the mind, then the natural is all what's the whole purpose of this? So we have to set a goal. So in part of the Vedas we have some very specific goals, Arta Dharma Kama Moksha. <laughs> and of course you're allowed to get Arta, you're allowed to support your body, you're allowed to get a little enjoyment. But you also have to follow the laws of Dharma to do that. So you're, you're restricted. This is the responsibility part, the karma part. You do it in such a way that you minimize your bad karmas. So we're allowed to get our enjoyment in this world, but it's restricted to some degree. And so uh, what finally is the goal? It's very difficult for us to figure that out on our own. So therefore most people in the world, they get re are restricted to Arta and Kama, that's their goals. They don't go any further than that. Even they don't get to Dharma. <laughs> so we do have to set a goal, but we should set higher goals than Arta and Kama. This is the animal level. Of course, the animals don't aren't even up to the kama level. They're just the arta level. They're just surviving with the bodies itself. It's the human being that wants the kama. He wants more and more and more and more. Mm. So if that's our goal, then generally that means uncontrolled mind. That means we start sinking downwards. <laughs> no longer human being. <laughs> so the scripture helps us define these higher goals. So it puts Dharma in there to restrict the Kama so we can get a clearer mind. So we know there's different gunas, there's Tamagun, Rajagun, and Sattvagun. <laughs> so Tamagun, of course, is quite miserable, ignorance. Uh, Rajagun is very active and passionate. Rajagun is very active and passionate. But not so happy. <laughs> so Sattvagun is very peaceful and happy. <laughs> so if we follow Dharma properly, then we get to a very peaceful state in Sattva. And the scriptures even promise that if you do nice Sattvic activities, you can go to Svargaloka and you can be very peaceful and happy and enjoy it for thousands and thousands of years. So in any case, uh, the scriptures will give us some guidance on these different goals. So the Varnashram system and Karma Yoga is at least they're guiding us up to go to Sattva and be peaceful and restrict yourself to some degree, but you can minimize the violence in the world that way. And to do all this, we have to use the mind also. First you have to look at the scripture, use the mind to determine what is the goal, then we have to fix the mind on restricting our senses in certain ways to attain the goal. 
и сега да пайцата след това трябва да концентрираме ума си да постигнем тази цел. So, if we don't have that guidance of scripture, what happens is we have all sorts of goals and goals and goals, but they're all temporary material things. Ако нямаме това тези насоки от писанието, тогава ние ще имаме много много цели, но тези цели ще бъдат временни материални цели. They all disappear when we disappear. Всички те изчезват, когато ние изчезнем. Or they may disappear even before we disappear. Те дори могат да изчезнат преди ние да изчезнем. All very temporary. So this actually is the sadness of many people when they get old. They realize it's all useless. I, I, I've worked all my life for these things and they, they don't mean anything. They're all gone. Useless. Yeah. So naturally, people want something permanent. So, Unfortunately, the material world is not going to find that. This <laughs> is all temporary. <laughs> so, this is where the spiritual element comes in. Uh, we have to understand that we're not the body, we're the soul, which is eternal. That's a very important fact. In fact, Krishna introduces this very early in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2. Very suddenly he just introduces that. Krishna въвежда тази тема много рано в Бхагавад Гита, във втора глава. So this is a huge shift, paradigm shift. Това е много огромна промяна на парадигмата. All of our life we're thinking I'm this body and I have to support the body with different material objects. Цял живот сме си мислили, о, аз съм това тяло и аз трябва да поддържам това тяло с най-различни материални обекти. И писанието изведнъж казва, ти не си тялото, това е глупаво, ти си душата. Това е голям скок в нашето възприятие да разберем, че не сме нашето тяло. Get beyond the body. <laughs> they can't distinguish the soul from the body. Even some religions. <laughs> so anyway, this is the very clear in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which just says, "You're not the body; you are Atma, eternal soul." And the body dies, but the soul does not die, and the soul is actually. Тялото умира, но душата всъщност не умира. Душата това си ти. Matter is temporary. Body is matter. Unconscious is lifeless. Subject of decay, subject of loss. When you're sick, there's all those things. All the negative things are there attached to the body. Тялото е материя. Той е неосъзнато, безжизнено, временно. То деградира, разболява се, устарява и накрая умира. So if we're very attached to our uh, bodily identity, we have to ultimately suffer. On the other hand, uh, Krishna says, you're not the body at all. You're Atma. Atma is you. So uh, Atma is a conscious entity. It's capable of knowing and perceiving. Capable of action. Capable of experiencing joy. It's eternal. It doesn't change how it death. It's beyond space and time. So, uh, we have to realize that we're the Atma and take our identity away from the body. So, this becomes another goal. We have Arta, Dharma, Kama. So, the next goal is Moksha. Let's get the Atma out of the body completely. So, if we're out of the body, no more material identity. No fear of death, no fear of future. No attachment to material acquisition, reputation, etc. 
Freedom from desire and hate. Freedom from thinking of friends and enemies, etc. So we get peace. Uh, because none of that's there. And we get satisfaction because we're identifying with our real self, not with the material body. Uh, so this is very, very attractive. But it's not the end. No, Another shift. <laughs> the Supreme Atma is also there. <laughs> We're not just Atma. There's a Supreme Lord there who's the guide, the protector, and the friend. So this is a, a, a great advantage if we recognize the Supreme Lord. Uh, because as he's the guide, protector, and friend, he can help us get our realization that we're not the body, we're the Atma. He can help us know, perform action, and experience joy. Mm. So if we try on our own, we can do that if we go through the process of Jnana Yoga and Astanga Yoga. We can get moksha, liberation, be peaceful and satisfied, but it's very difficult. Yeah. But uh, if we have the help of our friend here, Supreme Lord, it becomes easy. So Krishna is the protector of all living entities. He wants to show mercy to every living entity. Unfortunately, most living entities don't want that mercy. <laughs> so the only way he can show us mercy is through the law of karma. <laughs> and life after life after life, they get chance after chance after chance to improve themselves and raise to a higher consciousness. But when we recognize that Supreme Lord and appreciate Him, then He's very willing to help us and protect us. So if we're protected by the Lord, we don't have to worry about the problems of the material world. So when we recognize the Lord, the Lord is very pleased and he establishes friendship with us. Yeah. So we develop a relationship of love with the Supreme Lord. Yeah. So when we're practicing, it's called bhakti, when it's perfect, we call it prema. Yeah. And when we experience prema, that is when we experience happiness and bliss. Right. So the Lord is all beautiful. He is the most perfect, beautiful form. No fault at all. And it's eternal. So he's a perfect object of love. Everybody wants some beauty, so they have the beauty of the Supreme Lord. So, of course, the Lord's not just beautiful, surface beauty, but He's full of wonderful qualities. Uh, so, He responds, or reciprocates with the devotee in the most perfect manner. Uh, 
we act with love for the Lord and the Lord responds equally or more. Когато ние действаме с любов към Бога, той ни отговаря по еднакъв начин или повече. And this creates great satisfaction for the jiva. И това създава много голямо удовлетворение за душата. So we're not alone. There's countless jivas in the spiritual world. So we have the perfect community. Така че ние не сме сами. Има безброй много jivи в духовен свят. Имаме едно съвършено общество. And the center of all that is Supreme Lord. И центъра на всичко това е Върховния Бог. And it's all produced with great harmony. Okay, so we have to establish this relationship between Atma and Supreme Atma, Supreme Lord. And it's an exchange. It's not one way. It's an exchange of love. And, uh, and this exchange produces bliss. Which is represented by Radha and Krishna. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, the whole Bhagavad Gita is pushing us towards uh, establishing a relationship with the Lord so that we can be happy. Do that, we have to utilize our mind. <laughs> Uh, we have a body, we have a mind, so we have to utilize everything very properly. So, of course, we use the process of bhakti yoga. Uh, and we use scripture to help us. Uh, uh, and we have a very special thing, mantra. Uh, so mantra means to deliver the mind. So this is a very powerful way of delivering us and helping us concentrate the mind and deliver us from all the problems of the world. Uh, so there are many mantras. Uh, but uh, the highest form of Lord is Krishna. So it is said that, of course, thousand names of Vishnu is equal to one name of Rama. But three names of Rama is equal to one name of Krishna. So the name of Krishna is the most powerful of all. So therefore we should chant Krishna's mantra. <laughs> and of course that was already stated in this Gita Mahatmya. One mantra the name of Krishna. So we're following Shankaracharya's advice. And to chant Hare Krishna. we speak in the Western civilization of separation of religion and philosophy? Can we speak of that? Yes. Is, is, is there such a phenomenon of separation of religion and philosophy? And well, it's definitely there in the Western and world. How that, and how does it happen? Uh, I think it, um, it originally, like philosophy and religion are rather related to Plato. They were kind of very similar because he had uh, theological things within his own philosophy. But when we get to the Renaissance and after, science and uh, religion got separated. So philosophy went with the science side, and then religion stayed on the other side and actually lost <laughs> the battle, <laughs> ultimately. Um, <laughs> Whereas in India, uh, the philosophy and the religion were kind of intermixed so closely you can't really separate them. Uh, and 
even the philosophies which are very atheistic, they also claim we are following the Vedas. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the uh, Sankhya philosophy, they say, oh, we also follow the Vedas. <laughs> Sankhya philosophy, yeah, they atheists, they follow the Vedas. <laughs> and of course, they take many things from the Vedas, like the analysis of elements, they, say, they take all that from the Vedas. And the karma mimamsa philosophy, which I mean, is atheistic also, but he relies heavily on the karma kanda section of the Vedas. <laughs> So we can say the philosophical um, elements developed within uh, the theological elements. And partly to probably to argue with the Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> or to argue with Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya. <laughs> <laughs> How to train our mind so that he will remember Krishna in the moment of death, and um, if it's possible, uh, if this um, is given by the Krishna or the sounding level, or given by Krishna's mercy, then how to attain this mercy? Well, it's a combination. Combination. You have to practice. And therefore, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, very difficult to control the mind, but you have to practice, repeated practice to control the mind. Now, in yoga or in jnana, it's rather difficult to do that, so they have to, you know, struggle to control the mind. And in bhakti it becomes much easier. One, we don't have to stop the mind and we don't have to stop the senses. We can engage the senses. So we don't have to stop seeing, we can look at the deities. <laughs> we don't have to stop the ear, we can hear kirtan. <laughs> we don't have to stop talking in Mauna, be silent. We can speak about Krishna or chant Hare Krishna. And, and we don't have to clear the mind out. We can think of Krishna. Yeah, we can just think of Krishna. So it becomes much easier to control the mind simply engaging all the senses in Krishna. So we make that effort and we do it with devotion, then Krishna gives us mercy. And so uh, he gives us mercy by inspiring us. <laughs> so when we concentrate, then we get uh, some taste out of that. Uh, and in the whole process, then all the anarthas, all the distractions, all the material attractions begin to dissolve.
началото бе Словото и Словото бе Бог. about a sound. So we do have that also in creation where Brahma uses his mind and sound to create everything in the visible universe. But before that we also get Mahavishnu. And of course Mahavishnu is uh, glancing over the Tarna ocean. And we find the same description in the Bible where there was the waters of darkness or something. The waters and, and then the Lord looked over the waters <laughs> and he started the creation. So the glance of Vishnu was said to mean his will. So when the Lord wills, let there be a creation, then the creation starts. <laughs> Property starts to transform. Hmm. So it is quite similar to the Genesis description, actually, the description of Mahavishnu glancing. Well, we have two types of reasoning, material reasoning. This is more or less condemned. <laughs> but he saw me, it's useless. <laughs> but then he also says, well, we can use logic and tarka also. Uh, based upon faith and scripture. So it is described uh, that the Uttam Adhikari uh, in Bhaiti Bhakti is a person who knows scripture very well using his intelligence and very logically he has understood everything. So obviously this intelligence is there, but it is, you could say, following uh, the scriptural uh, conclusions. And supported by the process of bhakti. So, uh, intelligence basically means discriminating power. So, as we advance in devotion, yes, we do have discriminating power, but it is in conjunction with that devotion. Yeah, so, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, I give you intelligence by which you come to me. Mm -hmm. So we can say Krishna supports our intelligence <laughs> to understand scripture properly and get the logical meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. 
по правената логика. Same type of intelligence with which we check our material activities, whether they are correct or not. Can we say that if uh, we develop taste for Chen Nahon Yen, this will be the key uh, to uh, remember Krishna at the moment of death? Yeah, of course. That would be <laughs> <laughs> but of course, if we chant more often or constantly, there's more of a guarantee, not just once chanting. If we chant always, then it's a better guarantee. Now, Krishna is merciful. Even if you don't remember him at the point of death, it's no problem. <laughs> if you chant it all your life, still you get the effect. <laughs> Krishna promotes you in any case. How to explain to a materialist that uh, after the enlightenment, after the renaissance, huh? how to explain to an atheist uh, that uh, the Western civilization actually degraded after the renaissance, although it looks like uh, it progressed very much because of the old technical revolution? Well, we probably can't convince them, but what we can say is that uh, it has its plus and minus points. Uh, they got free from dogma. In other words, uh, the religion had confined the people so much they couldn't even think uh, common sense things anymore. So we can say it's like the swinging pendulum they, they, because of the confines of religion, they went in the complete opposite direction. But they have to come back to a middle thing where we accept both things, you know? <laughs> so we find in ancient India, this didn't happen. They developed science, but they didn't go in opposite direction and re reject the Vedas. The same people doing the science were the same people reading the Vedas. But I think uh, now the pendulum has to shift a little because science itself is at a standstill. It doesn't know where to go. No, I think that this is the Einstein raised certain problems and quantum physics raised certain problems and nobody's been able to solve them for the last hundred years. Nothing, no, no progress in science, really. All theories and they all get rejected and we're left at the same thing. We don't know what to, where to go from here. Einstein has continued to solve certain problems in quantum physics for the last 100 years. So they're going to have to shift their paradigm again <laughs> and go a step further and towards the Vedas.
can our mind cheat us in such a way that we're thinking that we're doing devotion service, but actually what we're doing is saparada. Okay, definitely. <laughs> 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 we have to be pretty low on consciousness. No, <laughs> But you know, Maya can do many things. <laughs> so basically the whole the, the, the guarantee for bhakti is that that's shraddha. Uh, which means that we the Atma itself has some acceptance of the Lord. Hmm? And that's enough to start the process of bhakti and get the shakti of Krishna acceptance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mercy, whatever. Yeah. But if it's only we're mentally accepting it, then there's so much problem can happen because of that. Our mind can cheat in many ways. Not to control our mind when we are very tired physically. Prabhupada was uh, oh, okay. Go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Take some rest. <laughs> 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 speech, <but> <laughs> okay. We shouldn't overstrain the mind. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> not, not good for us. <laughs> and once we sleep, then we can control our mind better than we wake up. <laughs> we can concentrate on bhakti more. <laughs> Jai! Jai! Jai.